Welcome to this new book launch series at Massey College. The series wants to celebrate books and the many contributions that our community does to pursuing research, thought, and reflection about our times. My name is Nathalie Derosier, and I am the principal of Massey College. Massey College is built on indigenous land, the land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful for the opportunity to continue our work here, and we want to express our respect to, for the stewardship of the land. This series on books uh, fits well with Massey's role as a place where ideas are debated. Books are certainly a traditional format, but they're still the format where authors get to complete their thinking, put word to paper, and fully express their views. It's uh, meant to be a celebration also of the labor that goes into writing a book. And I hope that this will serve as inspiration for uh, the many junior fellows that we have here that, who are busy writing their thesis right now. So in the coming months, we will be celebrating several books that have been recently published, one on policing, one on economic injustice and capitalism, one on the refugee experience. But today we want to talk about democracy. The book is Constitutional Democracy Under Stress, A Time for Heroic Citizenship. And it is a collection of essays edited by Peter Biro. It's always the right time to talk about democracy, for sure. But many feel that our views on democracy are being challenged, as many countries like the US and like others are experiencing massive unrest. And when countries who are less democratic seem to have times look more successful in achieving economic prosperity. Is democracy doomed as a model? Should it be reformed? Are they key concepts that must be cherished, polished, almost relearned? This is what we're going to talk about today. Now, full disclosure, I have penned one of the essay in the book, but that's not what we're going to talk about. And that's not why we're having uh, this, uh, th this uh, book launch. It's really about the ideas of the book. I want to... Uh, uh, explore the ideas of democracy at Massey. And I have to say the reason why we're having this book launch on democracy to start is that Massey is also celebrating a new partnership that it has with Open Democracy, a community organization dedicating to community building and the practice of democracy. Sabrina Dillon, who is the SFU Morris Wass Center for Dialogue Open Democracy Fellow and a visiting fellow this year at Massey, will be on Massey Dialogues on September 16th. So we'll be talking about democracy again. So let me begin with uh, the book and the editor, Peter Biro, who is uh, a lawyer, NGO leader, writer, corporate CEO, Chair Emeritus of the Jane Goodall Institute Global and a Fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts. He is the founder of Section1.ca, a civil society group that is dedicated to the practice of an engaged citizenry. We also are joined by, with, by Nidhi Panwar, who is a junior fellow and a second year PhD student in a collaborative political science and South Asian studies program that focuses on counterterrorism and human rights. She is studying India, and I think we're so happy to have her with us today because uh, India being the largest democracy in the world, so she'll bring a special uh, perspective on this. She is also the recipient of a very uh, prestigious Shirk Bombardier Graduate Scholarship to honor Nelson Mandela, and she is an advisor to the Canadian Red Cross because she worked there uh, in uh, particularly the management of the BC wildlife fires. So uh, she is co-founder also of an NGO that supported uh, health in rural Himalayas, where she is originally from. And she says that she's passionate about Bollywood, elephants, and having more stamps on her passport. Maybe not this year, but eventually. And we also join uh, with great honor by Mary Jo Leddy, who's a writer, a speaker, a theologian, a social activist, 
peace campaigner, refugee advocate. She has, uh, she's the founding director of Remoro House, a community for refugees. She's the author of several books, including Radical Gratitude and At the Border called Hope, where refugees are neighbors. She's received the Order of Canada. She's a senior fellow at Massey College, and we're so delighted to have you with us today. So uh, let me start with Peter. Uh, Peter, you are the editor of this book. You're the, the mind behind it. Uh, why, why this book now? Why is it important to talk about democracy right now? Well, very, very important in your introduction, uh, I think already laid the groundwork for that. Let me start by, first of all, thanking you, Natalie, and Massey College for hosting this. Let me also thank Tom Axworthy, who was also instrumental, he's uh, and a member, of course, of Massey College uh, for making this possible, taking the initiative to have the book launch. I'm really honored that U of T and Massey College is, is making this possible. And let me also acknowledge uh, Mosaic Press and Howard Astor, the publisher of the book, uh, for bringing this book into the world. In terms of the question, oh, and let me let me also preface my comments by saying how honored I am to be sharing this uh, this moment with Mary Jo Letty, one of my heroes and 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 most most definitely a model heroic citizen in the sense that I contemplated it when I uh, when I uh, sort of conceived of the book, and it sounds like Needy is very very soon going to be joining Mary Jo uh, in in that uh, in that uh, elite category of heroic citizen. I think, Natalie, the, uh, the moment cries out for the book. Liberal democracy uh, is meeting its, its reckoning. Many people now have, of course, as we uh, know over the past year and a half, political scientists, soci sociologists, political economists, and the like, uh, are, are trying to sort of take the measure of liberal democracy and the backsliding that is occurring throughout the West. There were books on, you know, you know how democracies die, on saving constitutional democracy, uh, and books of that sort. Everyone trying to really understand what is going on. It's very, very clear that in the post-war period, many of the core assumptions that we'd made about liberal democracy are now being tested, uh, indeed stress tested in a big way. Uh, and uh, not to say being refuted, but certainly tested in a very, very vigorous way. We see uh, erstwhile liberal democracies like Turkey and Hungary and Poland sliding uh, sort of backwards uh, away from, you know, liberal principles towards illiberal principles. There's a kind of resurgent authoritarianism, to borrow from Erwin Kotler, who wrote, who contributed a wonderful chapter to the book. The, and, and a rise in populism, to borrow from another chapter of Tom's, um, that, you know, that is occurring and that is really having a, a dramatic impact on the quality of democratic life in Western democracies. I felt that what was needed was something a little different than what many of the other writers were, uh, were focusing on, trying to explain the nature of the backsliding and its causes. Now, we do that in the book. But I was more interested in how we ought to be thinking of the response, if the proper response to the moment, to the historical moment, and to think of it in terms that are a little different than the conventional approach, which is to look at it from a policy standpoint or from the standpoint of state actors and governments and leaders, and rather look to what I take to be one of the most fundamental questions and uh, and issues I I really in the mix. And that is the nature of democratic citizenship itself, or rather the nature of citizenship in free and democratic societies. Uh, I began by asking the question, how could free and democratic citizens so self-defined permit a lot of the backsliding to be occurring that we're seeing, the, the ways in which the rule of law are being challenged and undermined, the way in which our commitment to a marketplace of ideas, uh, to the pursuit of truth and truth seeking, to the uh, importance of reason, to the authority of sort of shared uh, ideas and settled science, for example, um, to the civil liberties that we cherish and promote, not only at home, but around the world. 
how could free citizens sort of allow this to occur in Western democracies, inside Western democracy, without sort of responding? Was this a case of the the frog, you know, you know, in the boiling pot of water, not recognizing what was occurring as as it was occurring, and then you know not being able to respond until it was far too late? What was it? And I wanted to then move from the question, how is it that free and democratic citizens allow their societies and their governments to become increasingly less accountable and increasingly more authoritarian, to the question of how how do free citizens actualize themselves in free and democratic societies? How do they actualize their potentialities? What is the real essence of democratic citizenship, both in terms of individual participation in the world, but also uh, in the context of acting communally, communal engagement. Uh, and one of the things that was very clear to me was that liberal theory itself, and liberal democ- democratic theory and liberal democratic institutions are very good at articulating rules and principles, abstract principles and, and sort of making them concrete. What it, they don't seem to be very good at doing is identifying how we as members of community, members of society, define our conception of the public good and engage not just in refraining from doing that which we are prohibited from doing, uh, the liberal notion of you know, justice uh, and private law for that matter, Natalie, you'll understand what I mean, but, but in fact, how, do, how are we moved to actualize ourselves positively in the world mm-hmm. and to fulfill our obligations and indeed our potentialities vis-a-vis one another? And I know people around this table, including Mary Jo, most especially, have a great deal to say about that because Mary Jo, for example, has articulated a conception of citizenship that is very, very different from, uh, she speaks in terms of the grateful responsibility of citizenship rather than in terms of the rights of the party, so to speak. So those were some of the questions that motivated me to approach the book this way and to invite such an exciting, diverse group of extraordinary people to contribute uh, and to share with us something not only of their analysis of the situation, but also of their own history of activism uh, Mm -hmm. and engagement in the world. So that's the that's the framework for the book. So therefore, uh, you are moving a little bit to saying uh, we've been talking a lot about rights before. We should talk more about the responsibilities of citizenship in face of injustice. Uh, in face of uh, certainly what we're seeing uh, this time in terms of racism and and so on, the, so that you you wrote the book. Or the, everybody had to write the book before COVID. Uh, yes. And and so has has the promise of the book been realized more? Uh, do you have in, you know does the COVID crisis uh, continue to? Uh, actualize the, the problems that you identify in the book. Absolutely. I mean, we, we're in the best possible laboratory we could could want to be in to discuss the issues that, that confront us now. Not that we would wish such issues to be confronting us, but we are. Uh, if anything, the COVID crisis, the pandemic, has sharpened this problem and made it more urgent. And let me just give you one example. Uh, you know, it, I, I had sort of thought about and, and written about the problem of the uh, of the um, erosion of what I call a shared epistemic foundation that is so essential to be able to uh, proceed uh, uh, as citizens in a, in a free and democratic society, that you must have this shared deference to the authority of truth and facts and knowledge. We're living in a time when that is more needed and more necessary mm-hmm. than ever, but also in a time when that is under assault as never before, the the concept of a shared epistemic foundation, the idea that regardless of where we may position ourselves on the ideological axis uh, or on the value spectrum or on our sort of, you know, within our sort of framework of ideas, uh, values and beliefs and convictions, uh, you know, in the good old days, at least uh, ideally, we were able to think about convincing each other, listening to each other, and ultimately agreeing that there were certain institutions, science, the pursuit of knowledge, reason, 
uh, fact finding, the, the, the profession of journalism, which is also another form of truth seeking, that there would that these institutions, that these undertakings would help us collectively get to the bottom of what is true so that there would be some common foundation on which we could then have discussion and argument and ultimately generate the consensus that is critical to be able to address problems like COVID-19 and like, of course, global warming, anthropogenic, climate change, and other issues. So yes, yes is the short answer to your question. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's bring in uh, Nidhi here about, you know, so you read the book, I sent it to you, and and I just wanted to know, so what struck you in the book? Was that, does that speak to uh, millennials? This, does it speak to, uh, the younger crowd here. Um, for sure, thank you very much for uh, to Natalie for having me here and for Peter and Mary Jo to be hosting and for Peter for, for getting this amazing book out. I wanna start with why it's uh, personally very valuable to me. Uh, it's because I became a citizen of Canada last year, almost exactly a year ago. Mm -hmm. And in October, was it was the first time that I voted in Canadian elections. So the idea of Canadian citizenship is something that is still fresh. And it is still something that I'm learning about. The grateful responsibilities are what I'm starting to embrace. So something like this book with so many voices, kind of tracing the historical legacies um, of what Canadian citizenship has meant, but also looking ahead and situating Canada globally in the sort of global retreat of democracy has been very, uh, very enlightening on a personal level. So that's definitely been the most um, valuable part for me. I would, I would, I would like to point out certain themes that um, that you just mentioned, Peter, and that are obviously in the in many of the chapters in the book as well, which is the theme of populism. It's very topical. It is something I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom Axworthy's chapter specifically uh, discussed some of the themes of populism that uh, spoke to me. So there's I will just try to summarize some of the main points about what it actually is. We hear it everywhere. We hear it in newspapers. We mm -hmm see it on social media, uh, but essentially it's the, this antagonism between the real people, people who are morally good versus the corrupt elite, and that's at the root of this concept of populism. And the important thing that I got from um, Axworthy's essay was sort of the the importance of a moral or symbolic claim of populism. It is not so much empirical, but it is what populists claim to be saying about society. So one example was when Erdogan was questioned uh, by a journalist at an interview, and he responded saying, we are the people, who are you? So it is sort of that type of moral claim that makes populism so powerful. You can bring empirical facts to surface, but because it's so hard to counter the, the discourse that is so moral in orientation, um, it makes it difficult to counter populism per se. Uh, some of the other things that came up um, throughout the essays were, again, the causes of why something like this is happening. And it's not just for populism, but of democratic retreat in general. And there is... Um, we can identify some long-term structural causes that have economic roots, um, the process of modernization, globalization, the loss of status to for, for the working class, for instance, and the movement of jobs towards professional um, um, yeah. fields, um, also the shrinking of the welfare state, um, and yeah. that left populations vulnerable, especially during the Great Recession, which is closely tied to the rise of many populist parties, at least in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have sociocultural dimensions of um, demographic shifts, massive migration movements, and that is also lending something to the discourse mm -hmm. yeah. of Right wing, extreme right wing parties for sure, um, and also in our southern neighbor. And finally, I think the biggest sort of orientation of this is the is actually institutional. It's the failure mm -hmm. of the politicians, of the parties, of our leaders to be able to respond and mitigate some of yeah. these long-term structural crises. So it's essentially a lot of the grievances that are around that get politicized and the window of opportunity opens up for populists to exploit. So 
in, in the Axworthy paper, um, there was discussion of Trump's rise and of European populism. And I think all of these themes were very, very relevant. Um, I would like to uh, just bring everyone's attention to this quote from the essay, which uh, which connects to another important theme that stood out to me. It says, uh, Populism, populism arises when significant sections of the population believe that those in power are ignoring local needs and systematically tilting the balance in favor of someone else's interest. Mm -hmm. So here we really see the role of perception because it is what populations believe is going on. And that I think connects really well to Danielle Yetkin's um, social psychology of citizenship, which uh, was really kind of mind opening. Um, so they, uh, they added through sort of this more in common study, they identify tribes, hidden tribes of America. And what we find is that there's a massive exhausted majority that is, I mean, it's, it's not massive, I think it's 26%, but it's definitely the largest chunk that is disengaged, that is politically apathetic, that is not bound to an ideological core and is open to being convinced. But on the two opposite ends, we have the extreme wings, we have progressive activists and devoted conservatives who are the loudest. They are the ones who hear the most in uh, ideological um, and rhetorical debates. But what was really ironic is that the people who are most engaged, people who are at the wings, the progressive activists and devoted conservatives, actually suffer from the largest perception gap about what it is they oppose. Uh, so that was really mind-opening and also makes sense. And all of this was based on sort of the fundamental idea of individual merit and systemic barriers. So, so you yeah, yeah, so your work, yeah, yeah, your thesis is about India. So uh, uh, was there, and, and populism is part uh, of India's story these days. So uh, was there things that you could relate to, to your work about India? Absolutely. Um, there were many instances where Modi was mentioned, specifically the, uh, I think it was Daniel's chapter, um, mm -hmm. where he talks about uh, China and the sort of role of journalism and the role of the media and soft power that China is projecting. And there are parallels to India with that as well, because we're moving from this very secular idea, this very democratic idea to a populist, nationalist, authoritarian mm -hmm. group, which is scary. So there are many, many um, common themes there. And I think Modi is at the same level as Bolsonaro, Erdogan, mm -hmm. uh, Trump. So they, mm -hmm. they do come up together. So this definitely has a global orientation, even beyond Western democracies, uh, which is very interesting to consider. So Mary Jo, let's uh, hear from you. Uh, you're a contributor to the book, but you also uh, have a long history of being an advocate and pointing out injustices. So uh, if Peter's right and uh, Nidhi's right, it's the failure of democracy to respond adequately to injustice that are uh, facing us right now and this sense of uh, being uh, so disappointed and disgruntled that we are close to abandoning its promise. So is that where you're at? What's you, where are you in uh, thinking about what should be done with our democratic institutions? Well, uh, I do remember when Peter called me about this conference and uh, he started off by saying it's a conference on liberal democracy. And I thought, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> And then he said, and heroic citizenship. And that's the word that really grabbed me mm -hmm. and started me thinking. And it's like sometimes the most obvious things are the ones you know the least in mm -hmm. a way. And as I reflected on heroic mm -hmm. citizenship, I thought, well, I do know a lot of heroes. Mm -hmm. I, I live with them, ref, <laughs> refugees who have sacrificed a great deal mm -hmm. in the struggle for democracy. It usually boils down to that. And uh, I paid a great price, some people. And it's 
sometimes, you know, I just accept that as normal. But I, I think uh, when I look at them, when I listen to them, and consider the world in which we live, um, we do need heroic citizenship. And I see, for example, how great, how greatly the parents are so grateful for everything that, that a democracy means. You know, to send your kids to school, to be wake up in the morning and not be worried if you'll be picked up. Uh, so I do think that um, <coughs> our democracy is under great stress. I think that's almost too modest a word. It's mm -hmm. under, it, it's now uh, the Guardian Weekly just said, from Washington to Minsk, democracy is under siege and is losing the battle okay. and I think it's not just in other countries it's also here and certainly in the United States and uh, we need to wake up like I see the book and the conference last year that generated this book as uh, an invitation for all of us to wake up mm -hmm. and to think and not to take democracy for granted. And I mentioned that for me, it comes from knowing some refugees who are struggling greatly for the small semblance of democracy that they've lived with. Uh, but there are, I think, quieter heroes, people like Peter, <laughs> you know, quiet heroes who steadily, day by day, do things uh, to keep us all on the right path. You know, we are living in a democracy and we can never take it for granted. What I realized as I sort of glanced through the essays and attended the conference was that, um, we can identify heroes like Nelson Mandela, people mm -hmm. like that. But I think the next step is we need to identify heroic communities, mm -hmm. that we are up against so much. Uh, in your essay, Peter, I think you referred to, you know, consumerism and the culture of money that we live in that is so numbing. Uh, <clears throat> we need to be with other like-spirited and like-hearted people who can call it like it is, who tell us to wake up and do something before it's too late. That's, I'm kind of rambling there, Natalie, but. Well, the, no, well, it's interesting that let's, we'll be all four together now to just uh, uh, talk a little bit about some of the themes of the book. But I want to invite viewers, if you want to uh, ask questions of our guests, please write them down in on the sidebar in YouTube and we'll be able to uh, to read them to our guests. So it'll be a, please feel free to uh, to participate in this way. So heroic. Heroic citizenship, uh, as you said, uh, Mary Jo, we, we see it in people that actually uh, make heroic gestures to reach democracy or to believe in it and to sacrifice so much for, for the dream. When they are disappointed, when their children or their grandchildren are disappointed, is, is that when uh, they... Uh, abandon or is that why we're under stress that we promised so much and you know, democracy is as peter was saying it's good at giving great slogans gave abstract principles but then on the delivery on the ground on the justice uh, uh for uh, the black community it's not there so so is it because it's that tension between asking for accountability that's missing. Peter? No, no. 
Well, I mean, there's just so much going on here. I'm, and, I'm, and your question sort of takes us back to uh, to Mary Jo and 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 what she defined as uh, you know as heroism, at least in evidence, not in sort of the big flashy uh, you know acts uh, that are very much in the public sort of arena, but in those who quietly uh, struggle for democracy. And one of the things that I wanted to actually ask Mary Jo, which is really a, another way of answering your, your question, Natalie, is, is what, what Mary Jo, do you, do you think really motivated those that you know uh, to engage in that struggle? And let me just sort of qualify my question um, uh, a bit. The, the, uh, the engagement uh, I mean, heroism isn't something that is observed by others. It's not something that is defined by uh, by any sort of public recognition or validation. It, you know, my concept of the heroic citizen has to do with the the essential uh, inherent, either cultivated or inherent sense of duty to defend political liberty, and I'll just use the term political liberty in a very, very broad way, very, very broad way, to speak of a conception of justice, a concept, uh, you know, a, a broad moral sense, all right? Uh, and, you know, in my part of the book, I talk about what I call my secular decalogue of fundamentals uh, of liberal democracy, and I'm thinking from the standpoint of, say, an educator who is, you know, interested in developing a richer, more meaningful civics curriculum, that we need to ensure that students who come out of our educational system at all levels uh, not only know their math and their history and their science, but also have a strong sense of what is required of them as a citizen to, to preserve and to promote and to defend the values uh, of our society. Uh, but that is the sort of the, the, the cultivated approach Right, the engineered approach, if you will. But I know that a lot of the people that you work with, Mary Jo, uh, don't have the privilege of that kind of a cultivation or background, and yet they are heroes and they are moved to act and to struggle in the defense and protection of these democratic values and principles. What is it, in your view, that that moves them to do that? Because it's more than a sense of personal self-preservation. I, I know you will agree. Yeah. So what is it? Well, I see two things, and uh, I can't exactly explain how they fit together. But you have some people, and maybe you in your own life have experienced this, where you meet somebody. Like, I know a journalist who had covered every genocide in the world, almost, was very cynical. And he was in a tent of children who were starving in a medical uh, tent overseas. And this little child grabbed his hand and wouldn't let go. And that was his moment. That was what he was summoned by this little child. And I think you find this in life and in the world where there are individuals who are addressed and compelled by a situation in ways that they never could have foreseen. That's one thing. The other thing though is people who are living a relatively ordinary life in their own culture and they honestly don't have any sense that it could be any different. And then they begin to gather together with like-spirited people. And they then have a sense of empowerment that comes through being with like-spirited people. And, and I see that often, very ordinary people who nevertheless join a teacher's union or go to a conference like the one that you sponsored last, last fall mm -hmm. 
uh, I part of the reason I went is I wanted to see who was there. <laughs> yeah. Who cares about this? Who really cares and why? So there's way in which, uh, as my favorite thinker Hannah Arendt says, you you need to be with others in order to interact and get a sense of power. So. Just to bring in the, uh, Nidhi here, and then we'll go to questions. There's uh, there's some uh, very good questions coming out from the audience. Nidhi, like what uh, uh, Mary Jo is talking is when people internalize oppression and just abandon the, the very idea that they are citizens. You know, we've been uh, uh, <clears throat> thinking about this for a while, and uh, is that? Is that a struggle? Is that something that you that you see or that you're concerned about that your generation would be concerned about the sort of disengagement where you say, well, I can't really be that better. And then you just kind of internalize so much oppression that you just give up and, and stop seeing that's, you know, that sense idea. But what uh, any any comments on this? Yes, definitely. That is so relevant. Um, on the one hand, there are claims of political apathy. Um, a lot of people are moving away from politics and a lot of it is exhausting as well. It is a lot of things that are outside of individual control or we perceive them to be outside of individual control. Um, and it is difficult to be able to hear about it all the time and be able to participate actively as well. But at the same time, I think there are many moments of collective action that we have undertaken, um, even as young people. I live very close to where the Black Lives Matter protest took place in Toronto. And it was very yeah. uplifting to, like you, like you said, Mary Jo, to be together, to yeah. be able to, we, we voice these on social media all the time. We share a lot of updates, a lot of news opinions on social media, but the brick and mortar aspect of collective action is something that is irreplaceable. And so just when we thought that our generation was too digitized, moving away from, from the actual on the ground work, uh, these protests have in a way um, yeah. strengthened my belief in the power of coming together. That's, well, that's good. So that's, there's, it's a foment for political action and, and interventions and a little bit of heroic citizenship and the way in which uh, Peter wants it, which is to stand up, uh, to stand up for uh, when you see injustice and stand up to be a, a, accounted as a witness to it. Uh, let's uh, let's hear from some of the questions that are coming. So I have a questions first uh, uh, from Akash Maharaj. Uh, as the pandemic changed any of the conclusions that you drew for and from the conference about the nature of civic democracy and our ability to work to common causes? Well, Akash, I mean, I thought you and I were going to have that conversation together in a few weeks when we do the Mosaic Institute <laughs> podcast. So, uh, but I'll give you a little hint. Uh, the, <laughs> the answer is, Yes, it's sharpened. It's sharpened the problem that I discussed earlier uh, in response to uh, Natalie's one of Natalie's questions about uh, about the assault on on knowledge and the erosion of the marketplace of ideas. Nothing. Uh, I mean, I talk uh, and I'm thinking about this a lot now, and I'm, I think I'm going to be writing about it. What I want to call, at least provisionally, the social cohesion deficit of liberal democracy. And we see this sharpened in the context of the pandemic because at a moment of crisis like this, of not just within our community, not just within our larger society, but indeed on a global scale, there's a need for a kind of cooperation and consensus generation that civilizations rarely need to resort to. Uh, we really are one planet now and we're facing two pandemics simultaneously one is the global uh, environmental pandemic, if yeah. you want to call it that, the global warming crisis, and we're dealing with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I think we all know that the global warming crisis is the bigger one of the two, and yet the, the COVID-19 pan pandemic is the one that is you know, most immediately urgent and palpable. There's no question in my mind that liberal democracies are struggling to respond to it. And the ones that are doing a better job are the societies that tend to respect the marketplace of ideas, 
the authority of science, uh, the exchange of uh, argument and the, uh, the and 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 putting uh, evidence to the critical you know uh, scrutiny of of you know of of a a well educated society. Uh, the ones that are not doing so well are the ones that are skeptical, to say the least, uh, about the authority of science, where other values are coming into play. We certainly see it in the United States, all right, big time. Uh, and, and you have, you know, in the name, by the way, of one of the fundamental freedoms, the freedom of religion, in the name of the freedom of religion, uh, you are seeing uh, the authority of knowledge, reason, and science uh, tested and challenged in a way that one might not have expected in a society where religion is valued as highly as it is. But we see this in other societies as well. So I think the pandemic is, is again, sharpening the problem for us. Is there another hypothesis that we could put forward that societies where the inequalities are not as severe may be able to um, respond, not greatly, but actually respond better to uh, to pandemics because already they had demonstrated some form of social cohesion or some commitment to the idea of, of equality and that all lives were important in that society. I don't know, I'm putting that to uh, Can to, I just uh, respond quickly? Or and Mary Jo, yes? Yeah. Let me respond and I want to give others the floor, but the answer is obviously yes. And uh, certainly in the book, we look at economic inequality and the and the exponential increase yeah. of economic inequality, both in terms of the income gap and also in terms of the wealth gap, yeah. yeah, right? Increasing exponentially year over year with few exceptions. You can look at the Gini coefficients. You can look at every model you want. There, there's nobody who disagrees with that. And that is definitely contributing to the problem of social cohesion because because the promise of liberal democracy, particularly in the post-war period, and another U of T prof, uh, Lorraine Weinrib has written a fair bit uh, about this, this, this additional post-war element in liberal democracy, which is this concept of human dignity. Yeah. So it's not an old concept, it's a fairly new one. Uh, and it gives rise, and it gives rise to uh, the social safety nets that we understand today and the welfare state, the concept that we have an ob obligation to care for one another and to keep each other at a certain basic level of uh, not just subsistence, but you know, comfortable existence, coexistence. When that is disturbed and threatened by this kind of rising inequality, then the ability to generate consensus on other fundamental essential questions is, 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 is really tested because of course consensus generation is not just an intellectual or a conceptual idea, right? It requires uh, the next step, which is the sacrifices, the sharing in the sacrifices necessary to get the thing done. And that's not going to happen as easily in a society where the burdens uh, e economically uh, are, are, uh, are, you know, increasingly disparate. Any comments from uh, Mary Jo and Nidhi? Uh, yes, Mary Jo, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, one of the problems we face, Peter, is that um, the language of human rights and many other concepts that we have to articulate why we should care for one another have been largely articulated within a Western framework of meaning. And our big challenge, I think, is how to take those same values, like the common good, uh, and articulate them within the cultures of the East, uh, the Far East, that are not so much, would not articulate it in the same way that we do. And I think that's our present challenge. And Václav Havel, of course, the Czech president, said that, that we have to find a, a way of articulating human rights and the common good in other cultural contexts, if it, there's to be a global concern. Now, I just interrupt uh, your next yeah. question just with one comment is that I neglected to mention when I was responding to Akash that he wrote one of the most brilliant and moving chapters yeah. in the book called The Battle Between Emotion and Fact in 21st 
century democracies. And in a way, to some degree, he anticipated uh, his own question and, <laughs> and to some degree w went some way to answering it. Uh, I commend that chapter to everyone, as I do the, the many other wonderful yeah, chapters. Well, we, we, and we should inv invite him to come uh, another time on Massey Dialogues to talk a little bit more about the, this great chapter. So any comments, Nidhi? And then I'll move to another question. Yes. Yeah, I would just add that, uh, interestingly, from observing events, especially around the pandemic, there there are two movements sort of going on consecutively. One is an increase in trust in public institutions as a response, especially in Canada, mm -hmm. compared to a lot of other countries where public trust in institutions has grown during this period. But at the, other, at the same time, it has highlighted some of the inequalities in access to health, provision of health that you mentioned that go along with economic or racial or cultural, ethnic inequalities in Canada. So it's very interesting because with a lot of these themes, there tends to be a sense of Canadian exceptionalism mm -hmm. that somehow uh, we're prone to, we're, we're not as prone to a lot of these things. But I mean, as the events of the last few yeah, months of yeah. the summer would show, we are not as immune as we think we do. So there's definitely a lot more room for reflection and change. In that is nice. Yes. And we will be judged on our capacity to change. Uh, in, in this way. So Bernie Lodge, uh, there is evidence indicating that younger cohorts of citizens say it is not essential to live in a country that is democratically governed. Would you comment on this? Oh, Bernie used to uh, uh, do uh, the CBC uh, ideas. He used to be the producer for many, many years. Uh, so Nidhi, let's start with you. Is that is that a feeling that you hear? So I know there's statistics that speak to that. On the one hand, there's a rise of post-materialist values in our generation. So our generation cares more about the environment, cares more about women's rights, care, cares more about um, things that were not materially motivated as they were in the past, necessarily materialist. But at the same time, there is a sense of uh, pessimism with democracy. And this has coincided with the rise of China and the upliftment of 800 million people out of poverty in China. So there is a debate going on. And this is a reflection of global movements of hegemonic power transition and the uncertainty and anxiety that everyone is feeling about the way things are going on in the States versus the way China is coming up. Mm -hmm. So we don't, I'm not sure if I have an answer of of a certain uh, result of the younger population. I think there's a lot of contextual differences in where younger cohorts are located, uh, for sure. But uh, there is this is just a reflection, I would say, of the larger anxiety in, in the global movements that are going on. Well, so if that's the, the case, I think that would speak a little bit to, uh, to the book, which is uh, if democracies are not uh, doing it well, or not lifting a lot of people out of poverty at the same rate, uh, how are we going to say they're so good? You know, uh, uh, Mary Jo, any any comments on this? Nevertheless, many people, many refugees want to come to a, a democracy. Well, I. Uh... Maybe I'll speak for the younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, um, I do believe this is in the hands of another generation. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to young people, and we have a whole program of internship at Romero House that where young people come, the biggest thing is so many feel powerless to do anything about the world. And I think we need to communicate first to ourselves, but then to others that really together we can do something. And it's simply the, the challenge is to find out the particular thing that, that each one of us can do and should do in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm thinking here again of Václav Havel mm -hmm. and his uh, 
articulation of the importance of being able to set up something called parallel cultures. So groups of people that weren't completely dominated by the status quo. And as a group are then able to address the current questions in society, which was part of the Belt Revolution, how it began, and unfortunately didn't totally succeed. But there is something in that about people joining together. Like I think this book mm -hmm. and conference last year was a gathering of like-minded people mm -hmm. that gave people a sense of power of being able to do something in the world. So let's have another question. We have, I think, uh, time for, um, for Steve Bacon. So what do we do? Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. What do we do? In the U.S., half the citizens live in a fact-free world, disinterested in facts. The other half thinks that they're deplorables beyond salvation. So what do we do? You know, when we're split so dramatically, uh, what is it that, that can be done? So, uh, Peter, let's start with you. Well, that, that's a great question, uh, Steve, and maybe we can pursue that another time at greater length. I mean, that that is the problem that uh, scholars, social psychologists are focused on. Daniel uh, Yud can address it to some degree in his piece in this chapter, but, you know, it's the problem of polarization and entrenchment. Uh, and you you know, we, we have to try to come at this from a number of ways. It, it's the intractable, the intractable problem. I think the 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 short answer is a long is a long one, really, and, and that has to do with education. Fundamentally, we've got to be able to get people at an early stage, at an early, early stage, uh, to to develop some you know connection, not just intellectually, but at a visceral level with the, 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 the core values that underpin uh, democracy and liberal constitutional democracy in particular, because as, as we know, there are many forms of democracy, uh, but we are speaking about a very special kind. And although in reference to Natalie's earlier you know, question, is democracy really such a good thing? We're all familiar with Winston Churchill's famous dictum that there are, you know, that democracy is the worst form of government ever tried. Uh, that is, except for all the other ones that were tried, um, and and there is there is fundamentally some truth to that. Uh, it's a messy business. Um, it's imperfect, uh, and it's all and it's and it's always going to be vulnerable to all kinds of pitfalls. But those basic fundamentals, those institutions, those commitments to truth, those commitments to those core civil liberties and to freedoms and to the principle of equality and to the principle of pluralism and, you know, the whole range of them, they need to be inculcated. And if they're not, it's a real, real, real predicament that we're in. It's a real tough situation to sort of find yourself in now and say, I mean, let's put ourselves in Trump's America right now and ask the question, you know, regardless of who wins this election in November, if there is a winner. And, and we now know that part of the strategy of at least one of the contenders is 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 to muddy the, the waters around the answer to that question, no matter how it turns out. But even if there's a de decisive winner, what happens with the other half of society that is clearly not prepared, mm -hmm. not only to engage, not only to accept the outcome of a quote, legitimate electoral process, but more importantly, to accept some of the basic precepts that make Americans sort of united and members of one single, uh, you know, tribe, if you will, uh, that is that's the challenge. But I think education is the is the first order of business in terms of responding to it, and that's a long term project. And then there are there are a whole host of other things that we can do as a society that civil society groups do, that NGOs do. Uh, and that political leaders do. I mean, po political leaders have a role to play in yeah. the answer to your question as well, Steve. What about Nidhi? What about polarization? Do you see? Do you, does your generation look at this as a as a problem or as a fact or as as in, indeed part of life? I mean, you, you live with it. Uh, how do you see the this increased polarization? Uh, definitely, it's all 
around us. It's hard to escape. And there are several echo chambers um, that we all live in. And all of that has been heightened by social media, by misinformation campaigns, fake news. Um, there, it's hard to really separate fact from fiction. And in general, I think, like Peter said, like um, we have discussed, there is a need for more media literacy. There is a need for education and uh, cultivation of civic engagement at a younger age. Um, and also, uh, I would like to go back to Akash's um, essay, actually, uh, to bring emotion back in, mm -hmm. because there are very few things that can touch a person or really change a person uh, mm -hmm. that um, that have to do with reaching somebody's heart rather than their mind. So we we look at facts and we can debate facts, but the real art of convincing, uh, of ending polarization is to develop empathy, to, develop, to, uh, to listen and understand, I think, where the opposite views are coming from and storytelling is, was one of the things that also came up from the book. And that's a very powerful medium. And I, that's definitely something we could cultivate to to stop the polarization and actually listen to each other. Well, thank you. That's so wonderful. I forgot to say in the introduction how that you were uh, really passionate about Bollywood. So <laughs> you're right, films as being the medium that helps us maybe understand each other better. I'll go with the one last question and then I will ask you to uh, maybe use the answer to uh, conclude uh, a little bit on, on this great great beginning of a book launch. So Henry Lawton, needy Canadian exceptionalism may be healthy for our discourse in defending our, our faulty democracy in face of global trends. Exceptionalism is not always blind arrogance, or do you agree with that? That's, that's an interesting uh, perspective. Let's start with you, Nidhi, and other people can, can talk a little bit uh, about this. So, uh, a response about uh, certainly, I think on uh, on the uh, uh, racism. I think we we have to. There's no exceptionalism that can be argued here. Anything else that you want to bring up to the attention? I think it's not a critique of Canadian democracy. What I was trying to talk about is not that we should always be critical, but there is room for improvement. And unless we have voices that do raise these questions, that do identify uh, discourses of Canadian exceptionalism, we'll have no way of actually uh, understanding what the deficiencies might be. And we understand that as, as progressive and as healthy Canadian democracy is, no society is immune from threat. And mm -hmm. these may, are creeping up, they might be creeping up. And one way to avoid that is to be aware of uh, potential possibilities of blind spots that we are tolerating in society. So uh, it's not necessarily arrogance. I think it's, it's I would say, humility in, in <laughs> celebrating democracy, but also being aware of the pitfalls. Yeah, a, a little bit of modesty is probably uh, good when we look at our own history. Uh, so uh, yeah, let, Let's uh, do a one uh, final comments from each of you. So, what's what's uh, what should we do? What's the heroic thing to do for citizens? And what's the big idea that you want our listeners to uh, to get out of today's virtual book launch? Mary Jo, let's start with you. Well, uh, I think it to me personally, and I would suggest it's worth thinking about as a group. Uh, Heroism is not a single individual. We need heroic communities uh, where people empower each other. That's my main thing. And the other thing is simply we have to show that Democrats have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great thing. So, uh, Nidhi, when uh, last last thoughts uh, for, from you? Well, I'm just going to be a pitcher for heroic citizenship. I'm <laughs> really interested in finding, learning more about this concept as it develops. And I learned a lot. Thank you so much for to all the contributors. Uh, it has been a very great lesson and lots of fun. It was wonderful to have you. Great insights. Thank you so much. And Peter, the last word to you, since uh, it was your idea, it was your uh, it was your title. 
So well, I, I think I think in response to Mary Jo, there you know is, there are some people who you know dictators have more fun I think that, than than Democrats, but but uh, but Democrats have more responsibility, and I think really the point, uh, certainly my sort of conception of heroic citizenship is that it is within each and every one of us to be heroic. It's part of what it is to be fully actualized in the world. It is not about being exceptional in any way. It's about really ultimately, uh, you know, being fully expressed in the world, uh, morally, communally, uh, and individually. So that's my conception. I think it aligns very well with uh, with Mary Jo's. And let me just finish by, first of all, thanking Needy and, and you, Natalie, for your wonderful uh, stewardship of this, uh, and of this conversation and for your 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 chapter, which should be compulsory reading. And let me just apologize to all the contributors whose names did not come up or who I didn't mention in this uh, in this piece. There are twenty six amazing chapters uh, or twenty five minus minus <laughs> mine. and and I, I commend all of them to you. They're, they're remarkable, and I'm so grateful for you know for each of the contributors. Uh, you know, and, and their willingness to put themselves out and to reflect, in some cases, very much outside of their traditional box mm -hmm. in order to answer the questions that I that I asked them to address. So I'm excited about the book. I thank you, Natalie, for hosting this. And I and I hope that people will read it and will be engaged and will have some faith uh, in themselves um, to answer the call um, that, 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 that the challenge to democracy poses to each and every one of us. Well, uh, on, on this note, I, uh, I think we really want to uh, tell you where to buy the book. If you go on uh, Massey website, you'll see that you have direct links to two places. Certainly you can uh, visit Mosaic Press website and, and order it directly place. from them. And there's also IPG Books website where you can order the book. So. Uh, Feel free to do that. And yes, to the other contributors, uh, you know, we may have you here to discuss some of the, the good ideas about the future of democracy and the real challenges that we're facing. So I want to thank uh, Nidhi, uh, Peter and Mary Jo for being here. I also want to uh, uh, thank Matt and uh, Abra behind the scenes who are making yes. this possible. Merci very beaucoup. Fun. Thank you very much. And uh, we will have other book launches uh, at, the, at Massey and stay tuned for uh, announcements, one in uh, the new corporation in September, another one on policing in late September as well. So, à la prochaine. Thank à you very prochaine. much for being here.